If you have your Bibles this morning, you can open with me to Luke chapter 14. We're continuing in our mini-series. We're in the larger series, Walking with Yeshua through the uh, Gospel of Luke. And our mini-series has been called the Shabbat Chronicles, where we've been looking at these various Shabbat encounters uh, in, as Yeshua that we encounter with Yeshua through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and our goal in walking through the Gospel of Luke, <clears throat> walking with Yeshua through the Gospel of Luke, has been this. If, if we are the body of Messiah, that we as his people are to, we are to be the body of Messiah on this earth, that we are to walk as he walked, then we are to, we need to walk and watch what he does and demonstrate, and not just do what he does, but the way that he did it, that we would have his heart, that we are like a, like a child watching his father or like an apprentice watching the master, saying, how did you do that? What did you do? So that eventually what he does and how he does it isn't something that we're somehow just copying, but it's his spirit working in us that it's becoming who we are, that we want what he wants, that we think more and more like the Lord thinks, that we're being transformed into his likeness. Yeshua had come and he had declared his purpose. He was here to proclaim good news to the afflicted, healing for the hurting, freedom for the captives, and sight to the blind. He had come to restore what had been stolen. He had come to establish the kingdom of God, to establish the rule of God. What does the world look like in this place when it's being run the way God wants it to be, that he wanted it to be in the first place? What is the life that God intends? That's the kingdom of God, that where we stand that in this place, that in my home, that our, in our workplace, that more and more it is looking like what God intended from the first place. And so now as we, we continue uh, to walk with him, we're walking, we, last week we were in Luke 13 and uh, looking at a Shabbat uh, service there in which he healed uh, the lady who had been bent over for 18 years and then he straightened out what what the enemy had kept bent, and he straightened out, so now she was able to praise him. Well, this week, we come to Luke 14. It's a Shabbat dinner. And on this Shabbat, Yeshua sits in our midst, right? He sits in the midst of people who say, I love God. He's sitting with people that are there. They've been in the Shabbat service, and they're saying, I want, I want to please God. And he challenges us. In fact, it's an uncomfortable dinner. It's an awkward dinner um, where Yeshua is meddling with our norms. He's meddling with our status quo. In fact, the title of my message this morning is That Meddling Messiah. Uh, go, I had a, is the, my other slide up there, my Scooby-Doo slide up? No? Oh, maybe I cut it. I have a Scooby-Doo slide where it's like Yeshua in the mystery machine van. You remember Scooby-Doo? That's not there. Oh. At the end of the show, the villain would always, you know, Mr. Perkins would be unmasked, you know, and uh, he had this scheme uh, that it was going to be a carnival. It's always a carnival, isn't it? Some creepy carnival with clowns and stuff. And, and, and he would have say, I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for these meddling kids. And, uh, well, I want to suggest that there is a villain at work and he looks like Mr. Perkins and he's in our midst like Mr. Perkins or whoever, normal Joe Schmo guy. And he's working to undo what God wants to do in us. There's a villain at work behind the scenes, working incognito in the midst of our norms, in the midst of our status quo, working through in cooperation with our own flesh, to bring destruction to our lives. But Yeshua meddles. To meddle is to become involved in the activities and concerns of other people when your involvement is not wanted. Yeshua meddles with the villain inside of me. He meddles with the selfish guy in me who wants his way and says, leave me alone on this. He doesn't leave that alone because he loves us. 
Don't challenge me, Lord. Leave it alone. Don't meddle. Don't talk about that. Why can't you just leave well enough alone? Why do you have to, why do you have to bother with it? Just stop meddling. Yeshua loves us enough to meddle. He doesn't just tell people what they want to hear. He didn't go around just applauding everybody. Instead, he would pinpoint his spotlight on the area of one's life that was likely a blind spot, but it was an area that needed work. You remember the rich young ruler? And he says, you know, uh, I've kept all the commandments since I was young. And why wouldn't you just slap the guy on the back and go, great, keep that up since you were young, huh? Good job. Keep it up. Well, well done, rich young ruler. But Yeshua knew that he, have no other gods before him was something that he, he hadn't obeyed and he was blind to it. So he says, so he meddles and he says, well, okay, well, why don't you go sell everything you have and give it to the poor? And he was, he was pointing out in an uncomfortable way challenging that thing that the man was blind to. So irritating. Why can't you leave me in my self-delusion, Lord? I've, all this time, I've been like, I've been keeping all the commands all my life, and now you got to expose that I'm not? <sighs> this morning, this Shabbat dinner is one where he keeps meddling. Have you ever had a party where one of your guests keeps making things uncomfortable for people? where they just keep venturing into areas of conversation that you wish they would just, can you just get through the night and just stop talking? They, they keep saying things that make you want to change the subject, uh, you know, kind of where it's awkward, where you're kind of like, if, if, if it's not your house, if you're someone else's and it's happening, you're kind of looking down at your feet, kind of kicking the dirt, uh, you know, how about those Cardinals? Number one draft pick this year. We'll see. Anyway, can we talk about that, please? Somebody? I think it was an awkward dinner, and Yeshua was being that guy on this day. He just kept meddling. Listen, Yeshua is loving, and he's compassionate, but he meddles because he loves us. He won't just tell us what we want to hear. And the first thing that we see in this passage in Luke 14 is that he meddles with our self-righteousness and our misplaced priorities. And over the last number of weeks as we've looked at these Shabbat Chronicles, we've spent a lot of time looking at um, self-righteousness and kind of that religious mindset set that uh, often traps people. So we won't spend an enormous amount of time on that this morning, but he meddles with that. Luke 14 um, Verse 1, now when Yeshua went into the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees to eat a meal on Shabbat, they were watching him closely. And there before him was a man swollen with fluid. So it's Shabbat. Yeshua has been invited for Shabbat meal by one of the leaders of the Pharisees, one of the religious leaders. And uh, we can easily imagine that they've just been together in the synagogue. And now they've walked to the leader's home for the celebratory Shabbat meal. They're having own egg, and Yeshua has walked into the home of the, one of the leaders. He's, he's inside the house, and they're watching him closely. And again, the language, just like earlier, is they're sort of spying out of the corner of their eye. Let's see what he's going to do. Let's see what's going to go on. Is he going to heal on Shabbat? And lo and behold, it just so happens, well, look at there. We walk in the door. And there's a guy in his house that's swollen with fluid. Wonder what, you know, wonder how he got here. I don't know. The, the leader of one of the Pharisees has, one of the, has this guy in his house. And they're watching Yeshua closely to see what he would do. Now, there have been several times through Luke already that we know that his reputation is spreading among the people. Word of what he does is spreading. But it's also spreading among the religious. And we've now seen Yeshua heal on the Shabbat on several occasions. 
He's been challenged about his disciples picking the heads of grain uh, on Shabbat. He's cast out demons on Shabbat. And just recently, last week in Luke 13, we saw Shabbat where he healed this woman who had been bent over and unable to stand straight for 18 years. And that that, that synagogue leader there was indignant that Yeshua healed on Shabbat. He was like, you've got six other dates that you could do this and you're going to do it today. Couldn't you wait? So now they're watching him closely and look, here's this guy. Here's this guy, swollen with fluid. The man doesn't ask for healing, but his silent presence there was a silent appeal to which Yeshua would reply. Many scholars believe that the man here in chapter 14 was uh, actually suffering from what we now call dropsy, which means his limbs are swollen with excess fluids. And it's a condition that is discussed in later Judaism. It's associated with uncleanness and immorality. And so he's there. They walk in the room, not a word in the room. The room's silent. They're watching. What's he going to do? Now, this guy's life is not in jeopardy. He's not about to die. And according to the rabbis, not according to the Bible, but according to religious tradition, no medical treatment was to be offered on the Shabbat unless someone's life is in jeopardy. If Yeshua were a nice, polite house guest, he would understand. Well, I don't want to offend these guys. They don't, they, I'm in his home. I'm at his house. He doesn't, I know he wouldn't want me to heal on Shabbat. So maybe, maybe I'll just wait till later. No need for meddling here. He knows the way these guys think about this. Why cause controversy? Why continue ruffling feathers? I have, uh, Yeshua, aren't you done with people being ticked off at you? Can't, can't you just have a nice dinner? The guys lived with dropsy long enough. What's another day? But, no. Yeshua meddles. In the awkward silence, Yeshua speaks up. Verse 3, so Yeshua said to the Toya, to, Toya, Torah lawyers and the Pharisees, is it permitted to heal on the Shabbat or not? But they kept silent. Is it permitted to heal on the Shabbat? This is a difficult question to answer. Because again, according to religious regulations, according to the rabbinic regulations, it's not lawful. They... they it was taught that healing was to only take place on Shabbat if there was danger to life. And this guy isn't about to die. If, there were, if they were to agree that he could heal under these circumstances, they would be accused of being soft on Torah observance. But on the other hand, is it permitted? Is it lawful? Could mean, is it contained in the law of Moses? Is it contained in the Torah? And there's nothing in the Torah to forbid such healing. So... They kept silent. So Yeshua took hold of him, continuing in verse 4, and healed him and sent him away. And then he said to them, which of you with a son or an ox falling into a well on Yom Shabbat will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Yeshua touched the man and healed him. Nobody rejoiced, no ooing, no aahing, no one, no one marveling at the miracle. No one invited the healed man to stay. Oh my goodness, what a day for you. Sit at the table. And so Yeshua did what the host should have done, and it said farewell to the man. Awkward. An awkward, silent dinner. This would be a perfect time for Yeshua to change the subject. You can go, you're healed. So, ah, well, now what is that that I smell? It smells delicious. I am just famished. Ah, I love your new tzitzit. Where'd you get them? But Yeshua doesn't change the subject. Because this wasn't just a matter of him showing compassion to the man. He was going to press the issue. Apparently, he doesn't have a good social awareness of what's acceptable and polite when you go to someone's house for dinner. 
He asks them the common sense question, if your ox or your son, for that matter, falls into a well, wouldn't you immediately pull it out or pull him out? And crickets, nothing. Yeshua meddles with our self-righteousness. He points at our misplaced priorities. You're focused on these, your traditions and not on the heart of God. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves getting wrapped up with what we think are the appropriate do's and don'ts of everything, and we miss the heart of God behind it. We can become so convinced of our own righteousness based on our strict rule-keeping that we miss the spirit of the command, the why of it. Read the Torah. God is concerned with the holiness in his people. He calls us to be compassionate, to take care of widows and orphans, to take care of the strangers passing through. Because remember, we too were strangers. He is passionate about justice. He wants to make people whole and clean. Pharisees had begun with such a zeal for obedience. Their starting place had been a good place to root out corruption. They wanted to protect God's law. But along the line, their interpretations became the law. So when the Lord said, remember the Shabbat to keep it holy, to cease on the Shabbat, they began to define categories, 39 categories of work, and then a multitude of descriptions of what that Im entailed. So that no longer was Shabbat about rest. No longer was it about entering into rest. And God is zealous about restoring people to who he's called us to be. God values people. God loves you in the midst of your worst moments. When you wouldn't have wanted the stuff you hope no one here ever knows that you ever did. The season of your life that you're, you want no one to lay eyes on. In that moment, while we were still sinners, Messiah died for us. He loved you in that moment. He loves you now. And he calls us to remember we too. And then to love in that same way. There's a continual temptation, a subtle temptation to be self-righteous. To begin to feel that I've earned my righteousness to begin to impose our laws, to look down on others and say, well, they just don't do it as well as I do. If only everyone were like me. And Yeshua comes and he pokes and he meddles with a self-righteousness that distorts our priorities, that turns, and he turns our attentions and says, you love what God loves and God loves his children created in his likeness. We should love and value people more than our own interpretations and our own rules. We're not here because we're better than anyone. We were sinners in need of a savior. And so at this awkward Shabbat dinner, all these folks had to offer was silence. The leaders thought they were watching, spying on Yeshua, but he was watching them. They thought they were judging him, but their silent response to his healing and delivering power exposed their hearts. They were more concerned about being right than they were about that person. And in their very act of trying to protect the Shabbat, they were betraying the heart of Shabbat. And the host of the dinner may have thought, well, I hope whoever speaks next speaks on a safer topic. Well, Yeshua spoke next. And he did not pick a safer topic. He meddled some more. He meddles first with our self-righteousness and our misplaced priorities. And then he begins to meddle with our self-promotion. With our self-exaltation. Verse 7, Yeshua was tell, began telling a parable to those who had been invited when he noticed how they were choosing the seats of honor. He noticed. He saw the way they're choosing their seats. They're probably hurrying, kind of neatly elbowing their way to get to a seat of honor. I mean, the Shabbat meal is being served in no ordinary home. It's being served at the home of a prominent Pharisee, a leader's house. You want to be seated as close to him as possible. The closer you're seated to the host, the more important you are. And probably everyone at that table considered, was considered to be important in one way or another. 
which is why there would have been a level of competition to get to the important seats, to be noticed and recognized as more important. It's simply, this is simply one way that we value some people more than others. At the banquets in the ancient world, the basic item of furniture was the couch for three called the triclinium. And a number of these couches would be set up in a U-shape around a low table. And guests would recline on their left elbows. And I've got a picture of it here, yeah. Uh, the place of honor was the central position at the base of the U. And the second and third places, those on the right and the left. And as you moved away from the center, you know, when you got to the ends, that was the lowest place of honor. So here's the thing. Important people often arrive late, right? The honored guests often arrive late. We know it in our culture sort of making an entrance. So there you are, and you got a good spot, comfortably positioned at the head table, and you're smirking, <laughs> nodding your head as you look at those who were not nearly as aggressive as you. And then Mr. Super Important shows up late. And the seats have all been settled now. And all that is left is, are the seats at the far end, the seats without honor. And Mr. Super Important comes in and sits at the, the seat with no honor. So the host looks at you and says, um, hey, Mr. Trying to Get Ahead, will you, would you switch places with Mr. Super Important? Um, because he really shouldn't be sitting there. Uh, I'm going to need you to move. And uh, you understand, right? Yeshua began telling a parable of those who had been invited when he noticed how they were choosing the seats of honor. He said to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding, don't take the seat of honor. For someone more highly esteemed than you may have been invited by him. Then the one who invited both of you will come to you and say, give up this seat. And with shame, you would proceed to take the lowest seat. But when you are invited, go and recline at the lowest seat so that when the one who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you will be honored in the presence of all those who are dining with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In a room full of men who are seeking to exalt themselves, Yeshua meddles and says, everyone who does that, everyone trying to make a name for themselves, everyone looking to exalt themselves will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, this is not something new. Isaiah 57, 15 says, for this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. He says, I live, I dwell in a high and a holy place but I also dwell with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. Isaiah 66, verse 2, This is the one I esteem, the Lord says. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Yeshua said, whoever wants to be the greatest must be the servant of all. And we read that and we think, well, if I will serve, then I'll be exalted to a place of great, greatness. But when you look at the whole of Yeshua's teaching. He's trying to turn our mindsets around as to what greatness is. In our world, the more people that you are, that are under you, that serve you, the greater you are. If you've got 50 employees, you're great. If you've got 500 employees, you're amazing. If you, your greatness depends on how many serve you. And he said, Yeshua said, I come, who's better, who's greater, the one at the table or the one who serves? The one at the table, right? He said, but I'm here as one who serves. I'm here as one who serves. When Yeshua came, when he served, when he washed his disciples' feet, he wasn't somehow disguising the character of God. He was revealing the character of God. We live in a world in which greatness and strength and power are defined by taking, by lifting yourself up, by, by imposing yourself, by dominating by projecting. Oh! And Yeshua said, I'm among you as one who serves. 
that when you lay your life down, that's where real strength is. That's where real power is. Don't exalt yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he, he will lift you up. He will lift you up. When we humble ourselves, when we walk in humility, we're being most, more and more like the Lord. Yeshua is meddling at this meal. He's saying, let me see if I understand this correctly. You think healing on the Shabbat is wrong. The man was sick, now he's whole. That's bad. Okay, and then you think elbowing and nudging and hurrying your way into a seat of honor, competing for status, for recognition is right. Let me give you some advice. Your seating chart is all wrong. You've got it all turned around. Now the host can't be happy because no one knows where to sit, right? So he meddles. He meddles with our self-righteousness. He meddles with our misplaced priorities. He meddles with our self-promotion. And then he meddles with our self-deception. The host is probably thinking, could this dinner be any more, more awkward? I hope he stops talking. So, of course, Yeshua turns to the host. He turns to the guy who invited him. And he says, here's some advice. Verse 12, then Yeshua was also saying to the one who invited him, when you host a luncheon, or a dinner. Don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they might invite you in return as your payback. But when you host a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. You'll be blessed since they cannot repay you. You will be, will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. See, we often do things with selfish motives. I'll invite them and they'll invite me. But we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're doing something really special. I'm such a good guy. Look at what I do. I'm, no, you know, no, don't, no, 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 don't, don't say, don't. We can fool ourselves. You, you may, you may not be able to fool me. You may be able to fool me. I'm easily fooled. But I, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm the best at fooling myself. I'm a professional at fooling myself. I was reading a book by a guy named Paul Tripp, and I want to read what he's called Dangerous Calling, and he says this. He says, no one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. Whether you realize it or not, you are in an unending conversation with yourself. And the things you say to you about you are formative of the way you live. He continues, he says, all of us have a tendency in our sin to become very skilled self-swindlers. You tell yourself again and again that you are not the problem. It is that it is the problem, that they are the problem, not you. And you tell yourself that you don't really need to change. It's the people and the circumstances around you that need to change. What you are doing, although you probably aren't aware of it, is building elaborate, seemingly logical arguments for your own righteousness. Daily, you defend it to yourself and find ways to parade it before others. In our self-righteousness and self-centeredness, we can easily fool ourselves into thinking we're just so good. The host must have felt pretty good about himself. Look at all these righteous people at my table. I'm so hospitable, such a good host and leader. And Yeshua meddles with the internal conversation. Hey, next time, don't invite a bunch of people who can do something for you. Instead, invite the needy. Invite those who can't pay you back. Hospital hospitality should be open to all. Because, look, the Lord took us in our slavery when we were weak and broken. In ancient times, the one who hosted a festive meal would be placed on the invitation for future meals at the guest homes. And Yeshua suggests that such payback hospitality has no merit. Instead, the best hospitality is given, not exchanged in some sort of unspoken social contract. Scholars have noted that Pharisees wanting, because they, they were upset with the corruption in the temple, and in focusing on now we are to be priests in our own homes, and that our homes are to be 
like little temples. Um, they wanted their, their temple, their home, to reflect what they saw at the temple, that their home would be like a miniature temple. So then, since nothing malformed or defective was allowed within the precincts of the temple, they tried to extend those rules to their own homes. And that may sound fine on the surface, so, but for Yeshua, he tells this prominent Pharisee to deliberately invite not only the needy, but the crippled and the lame and the blind to invite malformed, defective human beings into his holy little temple. And Yeshua was meddling. He was pushing. And his meddling is rooted in this. It's rooted in God's love for every person. In God's pain when the people created in the very image of him are undervalued and mistreated by one another. Now, we know. We know in our minds that all people are created equal. And yet our sinful nature classifies people. Our sinful nature ranks people based on their value to us. What can you do for me? What is your status? What are you worth based on wealth, intelligence, social status, beauty? What are the qualities this world values? People end up being viewed as commodities where some carry more value than others. We have a remarkable penchant for self-deception. But the Lord meddles, he pushes, he pokes, and tells us the truth. He says, look at the ones that you look past. Look at them again and see how valuable they are. Love them and value them. He meddles because he loves them. He meddles because he loves us enough to keep challenging us and not to let us live in self-deception. Well, at this point in the dinner, he's been meddling a little too much. He's being an impolite dinner guest, and everyone is simply uncomfortable. And so finally, first time, someone else speaks up, thinks he's going to change the subject, and he goes, verse 15, Now hearing this, one of those dining with Yeshua said to him, Blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. Oh, man. Thank you for changing the subject. Thank you for moving the dinner conversation along with this nice little platitude. Try to ease the tension in the room by saying, Hey, despite our differences, won't it be nice for all of us to experience the blessing of sitting in, the fel in fellowship with God when he fully reasserts his rule? Yeshua doesn't get sidetracked. The little platitude opens up a nice segue for him. For his concluding parable, he just keeps meddling. Self with it, he meddles with our self-righteousness, misplaced priorities, with our self-promotion, our self-deception. -decept and finally, he meddles here with some false assumptions. He meddles with our self-insulation from a hurting world. Verse 16, Yeshua said to him, a certain man was hosting a large banquet, and he invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his slave to tell those who had been invited, come, everything is prepared. Verse 18, but every one of them began to beg off, and it goes through all the different excuses. Verse 21, the slave came and reported these excuses, these things to his master. Then the master of the house got angry and said to his slave, quickly, go out into the squares and the alleys of the city and bring here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, master, I've done as you instructed, and still there is room. So the master said to the slave, go into the thoroughfares and fenced areas and press them to come in so my home may be filled. For I tell, of you, tell you, none of those men who were invited will taste my banquet. The guy has said, blessed are those who eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Yeshua responds by telling a story that says, yeah, let's talk about that dinner. Let's talk about that dinner, about who's going to be eating bread in the kingdom of God. Let's talk about who's going to be there, because some of the people you think are going to be on the guest list may opt out. And people you are insulating yourself from the doors are going to be open to them. And the host is like, Oy. will you stop it? Here we go again. Some of the people who were invited, people expected to be there, decided not to come at the last minute due to a variety of excuses. 
The master is angry, but he turns his anger into an opportunity for mercy and grace. And he tells his servants to go to the streets and alleys and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Ugh, them again. The master intends to have a full party. Who gets to come? Who? Who are you inviting in? I've, I've encountered believers. I was, I was one time um, on staff and I, on, in a congregation, and I went, I, I came with the, to the, the leader with an idea for us to have a bus ministry, to go in and bring in kids. And I was literally told they don't fit here. And I didn't fit there for much longer, did we? We were, we were gone, so we were like, I don't think we fit here either then. I, don't, I can't imagine Yeshua saying they don't fit here. I don't think that's his heart. I know it's not. The people that Yeshua didn't fit in with or feel comfortable with were people that were, that were high and mighty looking down with contempt on the downtrodden because the high and lofty one dwells with him who is lowly and humble in spirit. That's where he's at home and comfortable. Yeshua said, stop, stop it. Stop insulating yourselves from a hurting world. It may not feel comfortable at first, but I'm going to meddle here. Reach out to the downtrodden. That includes widows and orphans and immigrants and outsiders and the poor and the imprisoned. Included now in my kingdom are those who were previously excluded from full participation in society because they are defective or more malformed or seen as religiously inferior. Yeah, Blessed are they too, because there's room at the table for them. On this Shabbat, this Shabbat dinner, he comes in and he says, you know, Shabbat was the one command. The first three commands point upward. The, the last six commands point horizontally. Look around, relationally. But the fourth command, remember the Shabbat to keep it holy. Because God ceased, worked six days and ceased on the seventh. Fo focuses upward and then there's this intersection where he says, and not just you Shabbat, but those who are within your gates. Those who are your servants, your animals, your children, those within your sphere your, your rest is not standing on them, but it invites them into rest just as I've invited you into mine. It's where loving God and loving people meet is in his rest. And at this dinner, he's saying, stop it. He messes with, he messes with our self-righteousness, with our misplaced priorities. He comes in and he messes with our, look at me, look at me, look at me. What about me? What about me? What about me? Self-promotion. You're going to talk about me? Lift me up? Me, 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 me? He says, stop it. He meddles with our self-deception, the lies we tell ourselves. And he says, let me speak to you. Look, let, let, let God's word deal with you. And me, before we stop, start going, well, they need to hear this. If, you're, if I'm sitting here this morning and I'm hearing the message going, boy, I wish so-and-so were here to hear this. No. I hope so-and-so is paying attention to this. No. It's for me. It's for you. Lord, don't let me deceive myself. And don't let me deceive myself into insulating myself from what makes me uncomfortable. From people from a, from a hurting world. He's transforming us so that we can be transformative. The enemy is at work, but the Lord is meddling to unmask what the enemy is trying to do. He is at work to unmask. Allow the Lord to unmask it. Say, Lord, search me and know me. Mess with me. Mess with me. Show me where I'm where I'm becoming proud and arrogant and self-righteous, where my priorities of what is valuable has gotten off place. Am I focused on all this other stuff and missing people? The 
people that are going to walk through this door are way more important than our brand new beautiful carpet that we have in there that'll be in here. Way more important than our new floors that are going to be there. They're way more important. The newness that we will see in here is a reflection of the newness that he's going to do in them and in us. And he's going to take up old, ripped up, glued down stuff that's been there forever and scrape it away and make us new. The people created in his likeness, we too were lost in our sin and he loved us to life when we stunk like death. And he's calling us to continually be transformed and to open up the doors wide and to invite them into the table and into our lives and into this family, into freedom and newness and wholeness. Lord, that you would be exalted, not me. That you would be lifted up, not us. Lord, Root out self-deception. Give us ears to hear your voice. Speak to each of us, Lord. Open our eyes to what we can't see. Thank you that you meddle with us. Thank you that you challenge us. Thank you that you don't leave us where we are, but you keep forming us more and more into your likeness. Lord, open the doors. Bring in the hurting Send us, Lord, to bring in the lame and the crippled and the malformed. Send us, Lord, to do your will. Keep meddling with us to make us more like you. In Yeshua's name, amen.